Hey buddy, cheers, how are you? I'm well, how are you? I'm doing well, I'm doing well. Hey Tim, I know, I know we've had success uh, specifically working with uh, kind of emerging life science companies, really biopharma. Uh, they get kind of a nods that they're gonna be successful. They're gonna actually go from R&D to operating. That's right. And then we help them, you know, prepare to have a, an operating business. That's right. What does that look like? Yeah, so emerging life science is, is maybe sometimes easier because what, because what they have are these really defined gates. Yep. And as they progress through those gates, they actually have higher probability and awareness. Yep. But at some point, that model needs to switch to what we, what we call an operating model. Right? Yep. That operating model needs to have the lens on revenue and the lens on profit where before it had the lens on business to, or product development. Right. Right? right. And so obviously those organizations go through the creation of uh, the operating procedures, the recognition of revenue, the control procedures, the separation of duties, sure. uh, the oversight and compliance, all of those factors come in. And the system selections, the, uh, you know, the aggregation of data, all of that happens in business and life science. But what I just described, Brian, yeah. happens in any other business outside of life science that's inceptive. Yeah, so you're basically talking about almost like um, the order to cash process and the company is. full through, right? How do you make money, right? Yeah. How do you make money? Right, and that's the evolution in a business. Now, what life science has, as I explained, is they have those defined gates. Entrepreneurs mm -hmm. who incept new business ideas mm -hmm. go through those same stages. What they don't always have is the same luxury of knowing their probabilities of success. Got it. Our value add, frankly, is none of them should have to understand how do you make sure that you put control procedures in so that when you're paying bills, yeah. uh, you don't have a fraud process happening uh, yeah. and somebody's collecting cash and paying bills or whatnot? You shouldn't yeah. have to worry about that because they're entrepreneurs. Right. They should worry about their business idea, their product development, how they get that to market, those types of variables. And I, and I know you and the team work pretty hard on, and I, and I think you guys call it a de-risking strategy, which is basically when you're in sort of some sort of innovative place, your likelihood of success, you get more and more comfortable with this as you advance through those gates. Right. But what we try to do is make sure that they can defer that spend, de-risk their launch until they're as sure as they can possibly be. Yeah, right? I think we love the term. The yep. de-risk term is a term we love, and we've tried to structure our service offerings to de-risk, meaning uh, we build in very small circles of success, concentric circles that get larger and larger and expand scope, all of them having checkpoints mm -hmm. to de-risk to make sure we're not on the wrong path or we're not progressing down a point of failure, for example. Yeah, because there's no reason to build an operating model and structure and spend all that money if the product you're, or service you're developing isn't going to have market appeal. That's exactly right. Yeah. So I think, you know, to summarize that, every business ultimately starts somewhere. It evolves, it grows, it progresses, and needs appropriate scalability to do that. Yeah all while making very prudent decisions to de-risk and not take unnecessary risk through that process. Yeah, right on. Very good. Cheers. Great. Good Thanks, talking buddy. to you. Yep.